now because you know what going on a road trip is just good for your overall health well-being and that's also what uh, we're going to talk about today with our guest Ms. Daniel Wembley she is with the National or NAMI what's it stand for it's NAMI Mississippi and it's the National Alliance on Mental Illness and they are up to some great things and with it rounding down May as Mental Health Awareness Month I thought we got to sneak y'all in here yes. and you're at your you're at the finish line too for May and all of y'all's events and activities oh yes so is it doing your mental health good to almost have this month over it is to slide into home plate and finish this month out strong it is helping but there's still work to do but at least i'll have may behind me you'll have may behind you okay and you've got a couple of road trips behind you we were getting to know each other and i I went ahead and set the stage that i was gonna uh, ask that so best road trip so i would have to say both of them say I have a best and a worst. My best one probably would be my Disney trip with my college friends. So all of us from different places decided we were going to go to Disney, and we just packed up in one vehicle, and we didn't have enough space. We didn't have enough anything, but we had enough time, and we had just a few nickels to rub together, and we drove from Hattiesburg, USM, all the way to Disney. How long did it take y'all to do that? It was supposed to take 12 hours, but it probably took us more like 14 between the stops and the arguments and the fun and the laughing and all of the extra. And I hate to use the word worst, but it's like you look back and it's funny now, but maybe the, you know, you're less favorable. Yes. Road trip experience. That one was also Disney. Um, I decided I was going to go by myself from Atlanta to Disney. And I didn't think that one through, so I drove straight through from Atlanta to Disney. You didn't think that one through? Not at all. And I I can remember the first day getting there and going to sleep. I remember none of the trip, and it was a week-long trip. Yeah, that sounds like it, it may it could have been uh, thought or organized just a little bit a little bit better with that. I feel like my best and worst road trip kind of combined uh, together. Our family took uh, a road trip to um, Gatlinburg. I think I was maybe in the ninth grade, eighth or ninth grade, and we were going to finally get a step above just a good old cheap hotel because that was always dad's he wanted the motel where he could you know um, back into it and walk out to his car you know the whole thing and we actually were going to get a cabin and it was going to be wonderful well my parents drove a uh, Saturn station wagon standard so horsepower not there and when a snowstorm came an ice storm came there in Gatlinburg that was unexpected and we got to get up the hill to go to the actual cabin that was rented do you know what would make it up the hill that little Saturn station wagon <laughs> she trashed so hard and my daddy even got out and got on the uh, hood of the station wagon and had my mama trying her best to put the weight you know and it was just so we ended up bad I, I, t- I told him he he did that on purpose there really was no cabin anyway it's t- it still ended up being a wonderful time and experience and it's something we talk about what Ten, you know, two decades later and, and laugh about. But, but you know, it's good to be able to laugh, look back and laugh and enjoy and have those good times. So be sure to share with us your favorite road trip memories, 601-879-4395. All right, so Daniel, you do, you mentioned you all have a lot of work to do, and you do, but you're up to some good work. So share with us maybe what the organization does on a daily basis for families in Mississippi. So what we do is we offer support for people who live with the mental illness as well as families who are supporting those individuals. So that's very unique. A lot of times people focus on the individual and they don't realize that those individuals are affecting a host of um, family members, friends, the community, everyone. So we offer support groups for the family members and we offer support groups for those individuals across the state. We also offer classes to teach those individuals how to be in recovery with their mental health because it's a everyday journey. And then we offer classes for the family members to teach them how to support those individuals. Because you know when someone gets a mental health diagnosis, there is no book written for that and no one exactly knows what to do or which way to go. So those classes are helpful for that. And then we offer trainings where we come in and we do maybe an hour-long presentation or just a um, sit and chat. And that's for everyone across the board to talk about mental health, signs and symptoms, where to go if there's a problem, what to do if there's a problem. I mean, any questions individuals have, we give them the answers that we can possibly give. And then we try to be a bridge to services. Um, We're not clinicians. 
So we are peer-led support, meaning everyone either lives with a mental illness or they are supporting someone with a mental illness. But in that aspect, we also know a lot of resources across the state. And sometimes we can be great bridgers to keep the resources in the forefront and send individuals where they need to go. This is the first time, Daniel, I think I've ever heard of it kind of referred to as in recovery, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, because, you know, there's two there's two trains of thoughts, and mental health is such a big umbrella term for so many different things. And I feel like, um, is it NAMI? NAMI? Yes. I think that's, I think you guys are kind of geared more towards um, diagnosable mental illness better than just the anxiety or sort of or depression or where do y'all what category of mental illness would you say that y'all serve most we cover all of it right because there are different categories one is serious mental illnesses which are like your um schizophrenia bipolar all of those illnesses and then you have just your regular mental illnesses that may come they may not be permanent they'll come you can get over them and then keep moving um but we have individuals in our support groups on both sides of the, of the coin because sometimes you may have one, you may have the other, and then they may be co-occurring. And when that happens, for instance, if you have schizophrenia, why wouldn't you be depressed over time? I right. mean, there are a lot of things that overlap. happen. Yeah, that overlap, and that is the reason that we just cover everyone. And the best thing about us is you don't have to have a diagnosis to come to any of our programs. You just have to realize I'm struggling and I think I may need help. And then come on in and the individuals who are trained can tell you, oh, that's me. So we're on the same path. And then they can kind of tell you what's going on with them and help with what you may be going through to help you not have to fight so many hurdles and battles in your journey. I think this is wonderful. It's a, it's a refreshing way to sort of look at it or sort of think about it. Because, again, you know, mental illness is an illness. And sometimes we do uh, relay it to the same. It's like if, you know, if you, if you had heart disease, you would go to the doctor and you would take your medicine, which is absolutely true. But usually heart disease doesn't come with waves of emotion or Mm -hmm. complete changes in personality or these up highs and lows in terms of the way you respond to people. And that takes a completely different type of tools, techniques and support that you I can see where the uh, support system would be so helpful to know that you could call someone who understood and help you talk talk you through those um, acute times of emotion. Yes. And it also goes back to not having the stigma that is associated with mental illness. So if you have a friend or a partner or someone that you know can understand what you're going through, you're not embarrassed to say it. You're not embarrassed to call someone and say, this is not a good day. What can I do? And then they can lead you in the right direction. Or they could just be a person who's a sounding board or sometimes the person just to sit in the room because sometimes people need that just to know that it's okay not to be okay. And so, Daniel, too, you mentioned the families around that. So are there like-minded support groups that maybe are only of the supporting family members and not maybe the one that has the um, diagnosis? Yes. So our classes, our support groups, trainings, everything that we have for the individuals with the diagnosis, we also have it for family members because the family members become caregivers. And if you don't know, you don't know. So the way that we make sure that the family members are effective caregivers is that we give them education on the mental health crisis that they're going through. We show them how to be more supportive. We help them understand that their loved one can live through this mental illness and live with the mental illness and be a productive citizen and that they can be a part of that person's journey and help make sure that that person stays in recovery. Absolutely. They can navigate it and put one foot in front of the other and just move forward and mm-hmm. take the waves as they come and, you know, get get stronger and better every day. I love that. I think this is a, a neat way. Uh, and I don't know if it's um, talked about as much that these res- these type of resources are sort of out there beyond just making sure you do get connected with the doctor. You are taking medications if needed and, and that kind of support. Is this statewide or the are the meetings and things across the state? Yes. It's across the state and it's across the nation. So our um, programs are, um, they are evidence-based. So they're formulated at national and then they're trickled down to the state. So any program you go to, 
there has been evidence, there have been studies to show that they're effective and they're going to work for individuals who use them correctly. All righty, we're going to learn more about NAMI here in Mississippi with Mr. Daniel coming up next. But don't forget to text in your best uh, road trip experience, 601-879-4395, as we continue to celebrate National Road Trip Day experience. It is National Road Trip Day. We're having a little fun here on Good Things. Jeff in Oxford chimes in and says, best road trip. A three-day tour along Route 66 from Tuscaloosa, uh, Oklahoma to Tulsa, Tulsa, Oklahoma, to Kingman, Arizona. And he said the worst road trip is the one to work every day. And I'm, I agree. <laughs> a commute is never is never a good thing. And Larry and Jackson, you've never been to Vegas, but you want a road trip there. So Daniel and I say we're going to fly to Vegas. Right. That would be a really long but probably fun road trip if done well. And then your worst was with your brother. A tornado followed us through Kansas. Yeah, I would say that would be a memorable experience. But, oh, you know, no. <laughs> it's the it's the unfortunate vacations that usually you look back and laugh at assuming that really nothing traumatic happened that you end up talking about oh yeah you know over over drinks or remembering when it's not it's not the great ones that always come back up it's like you remember when that tornado followed us from kansas to oh yeah yeah to wherever although i'm glad it followed you larry and not (laughs) and not me i I think i would have taken a detour uh, as quickly as possible but i don't want to detour from talking anymore about nami i think they're up to some really good things and since may is still national mental health awareness month it's good to know all the good that you guys um, you guys do. You talked about advocacy, too, and sort of breaking that stigma. Do you feel like we're getting better at that with mental illness of all kinds, not just things? I think, you you know, you mentioned the severe and then the acute because I feel and then they can overlap because I do feel like there's two different conversations for both. And sometimes mm-hmm. they get lost or just the anxiety and depression gets all the talk and the others are sort of left out. So, yes. yeah. I think we are making some leeway, and I think it's more so because of COVID. I mean, we couldn't deny it. Once COVID came along and people were struggling and then there were um, people coming out, celebrities coming out. I mean, the legislation is starting to look at mental health as a problem and making sure that they're supporting mental illness and mental wealth and mental All of that is now part of the conversation. So if it's part of the conversation from top down, then it makes it easier to talk about the conversation right in your home. How many families uh, use your resources uh, or about uh, in terms of in Mississippi? Or do you know how many y'all have outreached to? Um, We reach out to thousands. I mean, we don't even know how many we reach because sometimes we get a call that may be a one-time call and they're calling because their child is struggling. And we get resources and we invite them to our programs and we never know if that individual was the individual that showed up or not. However, I can tell you um, across the state of Mississippi, there are 431,000 people who live with a mental illness and that's diagnosed. So imagine those people who've never been to the doctor or never had someone to tell them, you know, this is not normal. You may want to go see someone. I mean, that's nine times the population of Biloxi. That's well, and if you people. take that and then you multiply the fact that they at least have two loved ones in their lives, mm-hmm. then that's going to be just 800,000 of individuals who are potential caregivers slash, you know, close connection to someone mm-hmm. who's living with a mental illness. And I think the the really unique part of Nomni's story is that you help those that are trying to help those that are navigating the mental illness is it like a support group is it are they virtual calls or is it uh do you i mean how does that how does the actual program work so because of COVID, we have had the opportunity to pivot to make them virtual some of them are virtual some of them are in person um and then we have some that are kind of hybrid in the past what we've done is we've allowed the program leaders to designate where the programs are because people who live with the mental illness don't always want to go to the place that has mental health road on the side of the building. So we have meetings in places like CUPS. Um, Some are in the community mental health centers. Anywhere that the individuals feel that it's okay to have the programs, that's where we have them. They go in, um, they can go to like NAMIMS.org and find our calendar, search for any of our programs and find out when they're happening and then just show up. You don't have to show paperwork that you have a mental illness. You don't have to pay anything. You don't even have to sign in if you don't want to. Sometimes I tell people, if you're not comfortable, put your initials. If you don't want to talk in the program or you're not comfortable with the people in the program, just, you know, tell them, I'm here and I just want to observe. 
because sometimes understanding that someone else's, you know, story parallels yours, it gives you hope. And that's the goal is to give the state hope and people who are struggling, make sure they understand they're not alone in their journey. So that's where the difference is. It's not necessarily like you're working a program like in recovery where you may get pushed a little more to stand up, say your name and all that for for good reason. Mm -hmm. This sounds more of like just come be seen, sit, listen, it's uh, support and care versus uh, working therapy. Therapy group. Right. And what I've found is that a lot of people will come into the group and they go with the full intention of not sharing, but going is the big deal. So once they get in and they start to share around the room, it's like, it's okay. I can share because none of these people will judge me. I mean, I've, I'm not able to go into the um, support groups unless I am part of that group. It's that structured. Um but I've gone into classrooms and talked to young adults in classrooms. And what happens is once one steps up and says, oh, yeah, I have anxiety and I take my medication and then it's OK, then it's like a, a domino effect. All of the young adults start to talk about it. And that's what I understand happens in the support groups as well. And that opens the door for people to just release what they're holding on to and to release the idea that someone's going to look at them odd because they may be struggling. So are these groups, like, all scattered throughout the week at different times of the day? Do they last generally, what, an hour? Or just trying to give folks an idea if they wanted to? Because I feel like somebody's somebody's got the inch, the itch to maybe yes. reach out. But, you know, it's still scary to do that. It uh, is. So Daniel, it's hard. It's hard. Okay, so they happen, um, they're usually about an hour for the most part, depending on how many people are there. The ones that are calling in, you just call the office and we'll give you the number. We don't want anyone. I know when COVID first started, there were a lot of pranksters. So we kind of hold our number um, very, very close. So if you call the office and you tell us that you're wanting to go to a support group, online or virtually we can give you that information that way and you just call in and be a part of the group um, if you wanted to go to a location you go online and to the namiems.org go to the calendar and find the location those are posted and when you get there um, just ask for connections if you live with the mental illness and if your family member or a friend just a loved one ask for a look for a family support group and then when you go in, you introduce yourself because that's always a good thing to do. And we just wrap you in love. The the people there know what you're going through because they've been in your shoes. So never be afraid to step in. Once you cross the threshold, we got you. We're like a big family. I feel like that's so important for the caregivers to really grasp today on good things. Is there's also support for, you know, for you, especially if you're trying to do your best and navigate those waters, whether it's with a spouse or a child or, you know, a loved one, because um, it can be rough not mm -hmm. understanding, you know, what it's, you know, because mental illness is one of those that's hard to to be compassionate when you don't understand why individuals may act a certain way or, you know, can flip with a switch or whatever it may be. But there's people that can help help you help them yes and it's important for the family members to have that because sometimes they want to say they're tired they're supposed to be tired i mean you are caring for someone else you're caring for a loved one it's okay to say you're frustrated with that individual or that you're frustrated with the system this is a place to get that out and everyone understands where you are they can give you things to do and give you help i mean there is um we talk about self-care a lot now in our support groups because our loved ones generally put their selves aside and their needs aside to help us if we're struggling with anything. And it's okay for someone to tell you, you have to take care of yourself as well. Because we've noticed a lot of family members just pour into their loved ones and they forget about themselves and then their mental health starts to decline. So that's what our, our support group does. It makes sure that that individual is taking care of their loved one, explaining that it's okay not to just feel like you're a superwoman and that you can't get frustrated or that you have to understand everything or that you have to accept everything you don't right and for someone else to tell you that it makes a difference in how you handle your loved one and even and one of the things that kind of gets me is the parents parents are always the ones that take it the hardest because they love their babies and they want to make sure everything is okay but we are there to tell you it's okay if your baby's not okay and it's okay to help 
your child or your loved one get help. Well, I feel like today's conversation helps. Daniel, I appreciate your time here on Good Things. Remind us, where do we go to get all this great information? You can go to NAMIMS.org or you can call us at 601-899-9058 and someone will answer your call and give you all the information you'll need. All righty. Well, you guys stick with us. we got a little bit more for you coming up next. (laughs) 